Welcome to the program, Dr. Conrad Duncan, back again. There we go. We got some great Thanks for applause. Having me. Yeah. No, listen, it's uh, it's always a pleasure. Um, we're gonna we're gonna change gears a little bit uh, okay. in this particular program, and we're gonna talk about some of these chat groups that are that are out there. Uh, you know. A lot of them are great from a supportive standpoint. Uh, a lot of these women have had uh, complications before in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they have uh, different groups. Of course, I'm not privy to those groups because I'm a male. And uh, this is private to, uh, to, to women, uh, specifically going through areas of SUI and POP, for stress right. urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, prolapse, so all, all those little different areas that that uh, women want to chat about. So, uh, you know, the good thing is, is that it's a great resource for women to uh, maybe share some of their success or failures do with the surgery. Uh, but there's also, unfortunately, sometimes when uh, things are discussed or said or questioned and then uh, sometimes the person with the strongest uh, opinion or view um, not, not always a, a medical profession um, will jump in and, and then that's kind of the end of the conversation so um, I've been connected to a lot of these uh, ladies over the years from these different groups and we've actually gotten some great referrals from uh, people that were seeking a mesh-free solution that we offer, so it's been it's been a positive. And then part of the thing I'd like to chat with you about is I'm going to go through some of these questions that um, people have shared with me and said, uh, you know, hey, this is what some of these ladies are talking about. So um, let's talk. Here is. Here's one of the questions, kind of, kind of an interesting one. Have you heard uh, a, a physician that says, hey, you've got, uh, we're going to do a hysterectomy, but you also have rectocele, cystocele, and the recommendation from this particular surgeon was he wanted to address the uh, rectocele, cystocele first, and then it and then address the hysterectomy after now this is just you know looking at someone's you know question it could have been the other way around but in essence right. in essence like dividing up the surgery right so removal of the of the cervix and then of course addressing the patient's uh, complaint of uh, prolapse so and it brings up a good set of questions, actually. So um, first off, you know, it, just backing up a little bit, these chat groups are often born out of sometimes a sense of frustration. And the one thing we want to make sure is that we we both empathize and understand that, and that a lot of women have been a lot of their problems have been ignored or treated poorly, and some of these groups going to get born out of frustration and camaraderie. And we have to respect that. And we, you know, just want to make sure that we don't become the enemy ever to right. any of these groups. Whether we agree with their positions, we don't. We won't ever agree with all the input or or, or or comments because that's not the way the world works. But as medical professionals, our jobs are, our jobs are just simply to give information, correct information that can be utilized by patients to make good decisions. And we're not. We're definitely not the enemy. And we we love the chat groups um, because we know how how sort of they grew because they grew out of frustration. But back to this particular patient, um, were they talking about doing the hysterectomy and the prolapse repair in two different surgeries or that yes. was the order they were gonna do them in one surgery? Yeah, no, that was two different surgeries. That makes it makes no sense whatsoever, uh, <clears throat> except first, my first question is what's the indication for the hysterectomy? Because hysterectomy in and of itself a prolapse in and of itself is not an indication for hysterectomy. So what they're saying is that we're going to fix 
what we believe to be symptomatic prolapse, the cystocele, rectocele, and probably an introcele. And let's fix that and leave the uterus alone because we don't believe the uterus is actually a problem. And if it becomes a problem, or if after we've done this prolapse, you think you have a problem with your uterus, which to be honest with you is really bleeding, pain, or some other abnormal or abnormality of the uterus itself, then that sequence makes sense. So if they're saying, let's fix the symptoms of your prolapse, yep. fix the cystocele, fix the rectocele, leave the uterus alone, then that makes sense. If they're saying, we are definitely gonna fix your prolapse and definitely going to come back and take out the uterus, that makes no sense. Right. So if there's an indication in the beginning for removing the uterus doing a hysterectomy, like abnormal bleeding, fibroids, uh, painful periods that aren't controlled conservatively, then you do them at the same time. So what's your percentage right now in your practice? I know that the trend has been to actually keep your uterus. I think mm -hmm. years back, right? It was it was like, out, no, no. everybody out. out. <laughs> you know? So what's that what's that ratio look like for, for you and your practice? I would say seventy percent of women keep their uterus. Um, it, 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 because the first thing I, 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 I tell patients is even when there's uterine prolapse, removing the uterus doesn't help me fix their prolapse. Their uterine prolapse is really the prolapse of the top of the vagina. Right. And so, so I will remind patients it's, you know, it's really their call whether or not to remove the uterus. The, the data to, to support removal of the uterus for an apical or the top of the vagina prolapse is weak. Uh, and it doesn't clearly say that it should be done to help us not see that patient again. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yep. So I'd say 70%. But the, the real sort of the, the elephant in the room is the ovaries. It becomes a tricky question because some patients who are, say, 60 years old, let's take that, that, that sort of age, a 60 year old woman may come in and say, well, I kind of want to keep my uterus, but I really want my ovaries out. Um, it, it becomes a really kind of dicey dance we have to do with the insurance companies because they don't allow us just to go in and take out the ovaries prophylactically. We have to take out the uterus and the ovaries. So it becomes a little tricky then, but but I would say 70% of patients will will decide to keep their their reproductive organs, which is perfectly fine. We we have no vested interest in whether a patient keeps or removes their 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 organs. We just like the patients to know that it doesn't have to be done. Sure. Um, and and so that's you know great feedback for this particular question just because uh it might be the fact of you know some people are going to come into the practice and say hey i want to have my uterus out uh not knowing or understanding that they could actually possibly keep it it's it's also a very regional um process in in sort of the south women have sort of always been more prone to say, okay, let's just take out the uterus. Uh, this is someone old, um, um, maybe not very reliable data, but that's sort of been the, the general cultural bend. And women in the Northeast tended to sort of say, I wanna keep my uterus at all costs. I would imagine that that sort of thought process has, has somewhat dissipated in the sense that um, we have a more national standard of medicine now than a regional standard. So, but it's a personal decision, maybe a regional decision, maybe a cultural decision. Different cultures have different, uh, may have different feelings about female reproductive organs. We've seen that in the past. Sure. So I think the provider needs to be very sensitive to any cultural biases uh, uh, or regional biases that may be influencing the patient's decision and respect those and in, encourage your patients to, to understand there's not a right or wrong decision to make here. No, I understand. That's a great um, recommendation. We're going to keep rolling. We're going to keep right. rolling. We're going to do some, some amazing little edits. Uh, all right, so another... Let me throw this one up. So, so this, this particular person... Uh, so they're going to have a, they're going to have a, a rectocele repair being done, and you know some of the things that they're struggling with is that they don't want to be on laxatives or stool softeners. They 
they drink tons of water. They've got, uh, you know, some fiber supplements. Uh, you know, they're using the squatty potty. We, you know, they got, they're, they're pulling all those stops. I think, I think, you know, part of it is just why they're going to come in and actually have the, the rectus seal corrected. Right. I mean, that's, that's you right. know, so they're, they've kind of, uh, went down this whole pathway to where they're going to be sitting in front of someone like yourself to say, Hey, uh, what's my next steps. Right. So they're doing all the right things from a lifestyle standpoint. Right. So what do they, what, what can they expect when they land in your office, when they tell you, you know, all these things that they're doing, right? From the squatty potty to the extra fiber to the, you know, everything else that goes with it. First thing to remember is your surgeon may or may not be the best uh, source of information for this. I mean, I have a, as you know, I have a great nurse practitioner who, who handles this both preoperatively and postoperatively uh, because it's one of the, I would say most common complications, it is the most common complication we see from any surgery done in the posterior compartment, meaning either rectus seal or interus seal or the combination of the two. So remember that that you can almost you can almost count on some constipation. So to do what this patient is doing preoperatively is really wise. Um, low low constipating diet pre-op, meaning a fair amount of fiber, lots of fluids. Don't pig out the few days before your surgery. In other words, the less food you have ingested, no matter what kind of food, the less stool you'll have, the less likelihood there will be constipation. Doing colase preoperatively, lots of fluids. Have your stools, stools loose and comfortable before you go in. Anesthesia post-operative narcotics, sedentary recovery, meaning you're not moving around so much, are all going to contribute to constipation. In addition to surgery, often, often it contributes also to the fact that uh, the bowels get pushed around a little bit and they don't function quite as well uh, in terms of moving things through. So we see constipation in uh, too frequently. Um, post-operatively, Enemas are generally okay. I would question or check with your provider first, but enemas for us are, are, are almost always okay. Um, we generally ho we hope not to get that far, but, but doing these things preoperatively and postoperatively with lots of fluids, colase, ducalax, these things are really, really important. Okay. So right. that, again, the constipation issue is one handled. Uh, it's important to handle it both preoperatively and postoperatively. It's a good question. So talking about that subject we're still talking about the rectus seal which is the bottom component portion mm -hmm. of your vagina uh, this this young lady uh, had an op has an opportunity to uh, do a vaginal tightening so the, the discussion with the surgeon was yeah we're gonna fix your rectus seal and we can also do some vaginal tightening uh, mm -hmm. Her general question is, is, you know, who's had that done? And then, of course, uh, what are the complications that could be associated with it? So one thing to remember <clears throat> is that this tightening, this re rejuvenation, there are a lot of terms that are thrown around that become almost buzzwords for taking a step back. We try to keep things medical. Let's try to keep things that... Uh, in terminology that stays away from cosmetic and unnecessary surgery to things that are medical indicated and actually have real names. So that if the opening of the vagina is too large, and what does that mean? Well, we generally measure it, and sometimes the patient will describe it as too large, but there are actually measurements that we have that tell us what's normal and what's larger than normal. Sure. Um, and so returning that back to a normal size is a medically indicated part of the procedure. Reasonable, medically indicated, it's not rejuvenation, it's returning the, the opening of the vagina back to what it was before children came through. Sorry about that. So the, the 
other thing to remember, the other important part of this is that research shows that if you don't return the opening to a more closed state, not closed all the way, of course, but to a state that's closer to what it was before you had children, you will decrease the rate of recurrence of your prolapse. So kind of think of it as you have an opening like this and you return that opening to something like this. Well, that has less propensity or ability to invite prolapse back into it. It's just simple physics. So this step to return the opening to a, to a pre-partum or pre-delivery state is a normal part of the procedure, especially when, when working in the posterior compartment. Is it always necessary? No. And it should be done only with the patient's understanding of the goals. Right. Uh, are there some risks? There are risks. There are about, uh, uh, there's a risk of dyspareunia or painful intercourse after making incisions into the perineal body. And the perineal body is that area between the bottom of the vagina, the bottom of the opening of the vagina, and the anus. That's called the perineal body. So anytime you cut into it, you can actually cause the patient after recovery to have painful intercourse. What's the rate? We suspect it's about 4%. But returning that opening to a normal size is standard part of these posterior repairs. So it's not as if this doctor or this patient is just saying, oh, let's do some cosmetic work just for the fun of it so we can return the, to a better looking vagina. It's not about that. It's about the patient's symptoms. It's about sexual function. And it's about not having recurrence or doing the best we can to make sure a patient doesn't have recurrence. And what are the risk factors that one of them is probably episiotomy, right, that mm -hmm. they've had years past? What do you consider to be those those risk factors of why they would uh, have to have that type of procedure, you know, from hey. like straining, right? You've got all those, that little checklist of, of such of, of why those, why the rectocele first came about and then the second one of course is uh it, you know having a higher risk factor one of them already could be as i mentioned that you've had an episiotomy 20 years back 30 years back and and now th you know that opening um you're going to try to reduce back to its uh i'll call it the manufacturer's uh beginning of, of where it where it should have been right Visual settings that's right yeah, the you know the etiology or the causes of prolapse are multifactorial. That's a fancy word to say. There are a lot of reasons, but the most uh, prominent insult to the pelvis that results in prolapse is vaginal childbirth. Now, when we talk about prolapse and we talk about the opening of the vagina or the perineocele, meaning the opening has been stretch out to something that's symptomatic for the patient because we're in the quality of life business, not life-saving business. So when the opening is a quality of life is issue, again, childbirth is the most paramount insult that you have. Um, chronic cough, obesity, all those things contribute to prolapse. Do they contribute to actual perineocele's mm. tough, tough cough? But again, it's mostly vaginal delivery, but even C-sections are not going to be completely 100% protective either. So it's multifactorial. Most patients with prolapse probably have different connective tissue than those who don't have prolapse. Sure. Well, there's a type three collagen. There's a collagen part, part of the stuff that makes up your tissue. Maybe a little different in patients with prolapse. Um, uh, that research is ongoing. We wish we had a checklist of all the etiology, but one thing to remember is that we never blame patients. It's not the patient's fault. The patient lived their life, and now they're coming to us with symptoms. One of the things that always remember is that as providers, we must take that sort of guilt trip away from patients and remind them it's not your fault, it's nothing you did, and nothing you should have avoided that has caused this. It's not like smoking, where you come in lung cancer and say, eh, yeah. Uh, or, or obesity. You, just, you, you may eat too much. Or there may be an addiction. There may be lots of things that cause it, but part of that is what you're doing. With prolapse, it's not what you're doing. Um, are there jobs, you know, female paratroopers? Are there some type of jobs that may increase the risk? Yeah, but you don't avoid picking those jobs 
to avoid having prolapse down the road. Right. So, so the, the, it's multifactorial, but childbirth is the greatest insult that occurs in the pelvis. Great. That yep, nope. Excellent um, comment, reviews. All right, so final, final question. Um, one of them, interesting enough, they, they were asking about us, our company, and then they were also asking about uh, a surgical alternative, which is going to be the, mm-hmm. we've got the Dermapure, and then we've got the Venu, which is, you know, the pre-cut shapes, right? So uh, they were asking, hey, has anyone had this done by, uh, you know, utilizing these procedures? And so one of the comments was the fact that, you know, from a data standpoint, we're sitting in there, we're collecting three plus years worth of data. You're part of that collection. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, we we know that it's, it's safe. So one of the comments was from a, another patient was, uh, this could be like, surgical mesh so mm-hmm. we got burned with surgical mesh and so we're going to wait and see about some mm-hmm. of these biologics and see if they're safe right so it, it was kind of kind of like basically saying hey i wouldn't get anything done you know we're gonna sit back and watch and, right. and, I, and I think that you could probably address that uh very very easily no, it's, it's a great question and very warranted fears. I mean, once the medical community experiments on a group of people, whether it's women or some other group of people, and says, let's try this therapy on this group of people, and it not only doesn't work, but it's a disaster, right. caution is warranted. There is, uh, you know, clearly, uh, as you know, there was, I was, I was, I, was, I I swallowed the Kool-Aid for mesh, just like almost all pelvic reconstructive surgeons did uh, before it was banned. Uh, and in one year, put in more mesh than all but one person in the country. So I, I, I did a lot of mesh. And I saw a lot of the complications. And I'm not, that's nothing to be proud of, because I put a lot of mesh in a lot of patients who, who did well, but a lot of them didn't. So 10 years ago, I stopped using mesh because I saw the complications that occurred. So I, I wholeheartedly applaud this patient for having caution. Now, shifting gears, there are two concepts with involving the use of a biologic material. One is outcome. We need to have, we're, we're, not, we're only doing this so that, again, as I say, we don't have to see you again. Right. And we mean that in a very positive way. We don't want to have to reoperate on anybody. Um, do failures occur? It doesn't matter what you use, failures will occur. And any surgeon that tells you failures don't occur is a liar. That being said, we want to do things that help us not operate on you again. That being said, there are different philosophies for pelvic reconstruction. Uh, well, the second part of this is, well, outcomes not having to operate, but again, safety. And that is of paramount importance. So we do not want to repeat the disasters of the past. So in utilizing this material, I've been using biologic material for about 10 years now. I've put in probably 300 to 400 sheets of biologic material vaginally every year. So this is a lot of a lot of data we're collecting. Uh, and honestly, we've never had a single problem related to the implant. No infections, no rejections, because the body actually undergoes constructive remodeling and replaces this material with its own tissue. So it's completely gone. Uh, it doesn't stay, it's not permanent. Now, that being said, there are also substances within the biologic material which promote healing and help with the healing process. Um, We cannot yet say, oh, we put this in and we just eliminate infections. Uh, We cannot say we put this in and we guarantee it's a better outcome than the mesh. We cannot say that yet because we don't have the proof of that yet. What we have is lots of implants in lots of patients without complications related to the implant. Uh, the data on whether or not it's the best thing since sliced bread, we're not trying to sell snake oil. We're trying to get reasonable tissue reapproximation 
without pulling the patient's tissue too far across and trying to get that tissue substitution with abnormal placement of the patient's own tissue. In other words, the graft is used as tissue substitution, just as this graft is used if you have a ulcer or a burn or need skin grafting, it's used there too. So it's, it's commonly used in medicine uh, for tissue replacement. Uh, again, the way it's processed, it's removing all hair, all follicles, all split glands. It's really just the protein that's left. And that, and we, without getting into too much of the medical jargon, what's left behind are basically things that help healing. So, but the patient's concern, the patient has very reasonable and viable concerns. And it's a patient that you would have to say, well, uh, we, can, we can simply talk about the data that we have but not about the proof that she's looking for. Right. That makes sense. Right. Nope. That, that it, it certainly does, and you can see that uh, to your point that the patients have their guards up, right? I mean, they're yeah. they're, right they're, they're you know they're looking for different alternative, different alternative solutions. Uh, one of the things that that you've been doing for quite some time has been utilizing biologics for uh, stress urinary incontinence. You want to maybe just talk a little bit about that in your practice, just because that is uh, probably more unique um, than some of your colleagues out there as, as, as an option. Yeah. Um, and w uh, it probably we should schedule our next podcast to discuss stress incontinence and urge incontinence as a separate, as a yeah. total podcast, because uh, we're only going to, I'm only going to briefly touch on some of the history and kind of why we do, uh, why I do what I do now. Why our, our practice does what it does. Um, so just briefly, and I know our audience is broad. We have consumers slash patients and we have residents and we have fellows and we have practicing physicians. So, we, you know, we, we give these podcasts with the, understanding that some of this is over somebody's head and some of it's sort of like, come on down, we know this. But, I, you know, we're going to try to hit just a little history here. Mesh slings became the gold standard uh, in the late 90s because they were easy, they were reproducible, and they were very effective. Uh, it basically replaced the Birch procedure as the gold standard. Birch is still a gold standard, but nobody does them anymore because they're very difficult. We still do them in our practice fairly, you know, fairly regularly, but but I'm old, so I learned how to do them before mesh became the gold standard. When mesh became the gold standard to fix stress incontinence, that's the loss of urine when you laugh, cough, exercise, or jump around. When mesh became the gold standard, placing it vaginally, wonderful procedure, revolutionized care for stress incontinence. 90% effective, uh, very few complications, but it was mesh. And so the complications that did occur were not great. Um, and the repair of stress incontinence from the vaginal approach, placing a sling in, which basically just sits underneath the urethra. Uh, uh, basically, it's just a piece of mesh that goes underneath the urethra here. It's physics. It's vector physics, and it works. Think of a garden hose, and that urethra is a garden hose with water going through it. If you try to occlude it on a trampoline or mud, not very effective. You put something hard underneath that garden hose and try to include it, it works. Right. It's basic physics. So the mesh placed underneath the urethra really worked, but it's mesh. And mesh, without getting into a, a soliloquy about the, you know, the, the, the pros and cons of mesh, um, if you think of this as a physics problem, what else can we put there? Well, we can put your own tissue. How can we put your own tissue under in, underneath the urethra? Well, we can harvest it from you or we can put a graft in there that's made of this biologic material, which will undergo reconstructive, reconstructive modeling, which will then become your own tissue. Um, again, it works because it's physics. Is it as good as a mesh procedure? We don't have that proof, but we've been doing this for 10 years and it seems to work great. Now, is it possible that everyone I put in, the patient runs off, says, Duncan's the worst doctor in the world? And I probably would have heard about that. But it works because it's physics. We use the same physics, the same procedure, just a different material. And so the pivot has not occurred completely, if not 
much at all because mesh kits are still available. And in some countries, they're, they have banned those just like they banned mesh for prolapse repair in the vagina. Sure. Other countries have banned mesh for incontinence. Our FDA has not yet done that. Um, perhaps they got busy with COVID, perhaps they have external pressures, perhaps they haven't seen any reason to do so. Sure. But certainly as an alternative, using a biologic material instead of mesh for your sling is incredibly reasonable. As a matter of fact, it was around even before mesh kits came out to use autologous fascia, meaning harvesting material from the patient's body as a sling procedure. We always know we always knew that that worked. We always knew that that was an okay idea. We always knew that it was a great procedure. So I have not reinvented anything. I've only taken the procedures that are now packaged as a mesh, applied the physics of why they work, and then return to using a very old procedure of using biologic tissue, right. whether it's the patient's own biologic tissue or the newer stuff that we have, which undergoes constructive remodeling and turns into the patient's own tissue. So we're trying to push the needle in a very safe way um, and not put foreign material into the vagina. It's a great place to close. We can certainly unpack the world of SUI and, and the different options that are Yes. out there uh, certainly you know i think that the the biggest thing is that you've got some great safety with your technique and then at the same time you're seeing the efficacy that that both you want your nurse practitioner and then also the patient uh otherwise you're gonna you're gonna hear about it right you're gonna have to change your you, you'd have to change your change your tactic to change your approach uh but you haven't had to do that, and and that means that it's working. So those are all. It's working. We, those, those we do follow our patients. Yes, we follow our patients, and it does work. So, um, uh, no, we 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 again have just not reinvented anything. Just applied the safest, most efficacious uh, procedures to these problems, and trying to get women the best health care they can they can see. that they deserve, and they deserve it because they're moms. Moms, sisters, you know, exactly, brothers, exactly. So, uh, Dr. Duncan, as always, thank you so much. Thanks for joining fun. joining the program, answering some questions from our Facebook friends. Uh, I think it's a great uh, place for them to share some of their uh, their stories, and and those are those are always positive. So we always love the fact that uh, it could be a forum for them and at the same time we want to be able to maybe give them some uh, information that can help them make a decision and uh, i think we did that today and one other just quick note that when we talk about surgical slings the biologic sling we're talking about a surgical procedure don't forget there are non-surgical methods we will always discuss with the patient before we ever get to surgery so just again, again, we are not, we are neither the enemy nor the aggressive surgeons that are trying to operate on everybody. We just right. want patients to be dropped okay. and to have a quality of life improved. So there's a whole host of non-surgical interventions that we also uh, offer and discuss. So, yep. but in terms of the surgical intervention, the biologic sling is, is, is the home run. There you go. There you go. Perfect. Great way to end. Right. Have a great weekend. See you. And we'll talk real again soon. And let me know what follow-up I can give you and, Enjoy the weekend. Thank you. You do the same. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.